Um, so, I would like to introduce or reintroduce you all to Bill Scott. He's our newsletter editor. Um, Scott was here to these bees. His first interactions with bees were actually in Africa. So, he's, he's a great resource for us when it comes to AHB and talking about that. So, he's a good person to talk to. He was actually in the Peace Corps in Gambia in 2011. And when he came back, he focused on doing top bar beekeeping, which um, he is very good at. I watched him um, take apart a top bar hive and put it into a bigger one at Gary's um, earlier in the year, and it was fascinating. It was really, and he was so calm and so beautiful about it, and it really, I, I was very impressed. So his presentation is going to focus on biological reasons of doing treatment-free beekeeping and to grow your apiary. So welcome, Scott. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening. Ooh, loud. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd just like to start out by saying um, that I feel truly honored to be able to come before the association and be your guest speaker tonight. Um, I've got a slideshow ready. It's about 40 slides. I've timed it to be about 53 minutes in length. Um, if I remember to slow down and take a breath. <laughs> and I'm sure it will help, help guide my thoughts along here. I'm going to probably say some pretty heretical things tonight. Um, I haven't always been a treatment free beekeeper. I started out with integrated pest management. Um, and I have myself used oxalic acid and formic acid treatments when I was beginning my education. And as far as treatments go, I think those are perfectly fine ways to uh, work towards um, treating our bees as little as possible to control varroa. And I'm going to speak from my experience only. My experience is running less than 50 colonies. Um, so I don't presume to speak for operations that are larger than 50 colonies in size. Uh, but I would like to educate all of you that there are commercial scale um, beekeepers who are running treatment-free apiaries. Uh, the methods are getting better all the time, and it's, it's a possibility. Um, oh, that's okay. Let's, let me see what slide one was. Slide one was... Um, Slide one was a bit about myself. So I was in the Peace Corps uh, for agroforestry, which is the combination of forestry and agriculture. And I was in West Africa, a little country called Gambia. And I went there for gardening, and along the way I got caught up in beekeeping. And the very first day that I, I, I came back from the training center with a little nuke box um, designed for pop bar hives, and I put the nuke box out in the village um, garden, and lo and behold, that very first night, I caught myself a swarm. <laughs> uh, so I said, oh, I'm in for it. The um, thing is about the African bees is they, they are really, truly different from um, what we have here in Europe and the Americas. Um, and when I would go to the training sessions in the Gambia, uh, we would all go out to the apiary, and we'd be in the apiary for an hour or so. So the bees, although they would boil out of the beehives and attack us, after half an hour they'd get tired of flying and they would commonly clump on the backs of our um, suits by the, by the hundreds at least. I mean, you'd have a cantaloupe of bees hanging off the back of your suit um, after a half hour had gone by. Um, Well, I brought some um, models of what I use in apiaries. Um, let me back up here and say that my experience in keeping bees is not 100% all top bar. Uh, when I came back from the Peace Corps, it was in January 2013. We were in the middle of our, we still are in our drought. Um, but we came, I came back and I was all gung ho, and I met up with uh, the father of a friend from college. His name is Volker Ackerman. He's in the Marin Bee Club. And through Volker, I met uh, Robert McKinney, who runs City Bees. And they really took me, um, took me under. And for that first spring, they let me have run of their apiary. They set me up with two bee colonies that we raised together that spring. And they said, here you go. Now they're yours. And, um, but they, 
I have the utmost respect for those two gentlemen because they showed me what to read, showed me how to start thinking about bees. Um, they are very much into trying to figure out how to use bee biology and bee breeding, how we can outbreed the varroa mite um, instead of always relying on the, on the chemical treadmill, chemical and then bee resistance and pest resistance. Um, so during that first year, I grew from zero colonies to 10 colonies, and they were all in Langstroth boxes. And I would make my own Langstroth boxes and frames. Um, I didn't know what to get everybody. Uh, and then I decided after a year of the Langstroth boxes that I would want to go back to the top bar style that I learned. And so I converted to top bar, and now I run about 20 colonies, plus or minus as the season goes. Um, no, not yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I have three sizes, and, and what I'm trying to do is, is the frame beekeepers have it figured out, and so I'm just following them, really. You have your nuke box, really handy, just like a beekeeping nuke is. You can have a, uh, a medium box. Uh, this is bigger than a deep, but it can have enough storage to get honey, to get a colony through winter. And then for honey production, you have the big four footer. And um, when you harvest the top bar colony of uh, honeycomb, you want to make sure that it's all honey and no brood. And, and so simply having it be this big to be all honey kind of makes you more conscious about all, that, all the energy that bees have to expend in order to make honey, to make wax, to make the nest. And the theme of my talk is going to be for beekeeper education, trying to think about what the bees have to do in order to survive, um, how much energy they have to uh, eat in order to heat the nest winter long, year long, in order to uh, evaporate the water out of nectar through condensation, not through ventilation, but through condensation, and how they, they manipulate the hive to do, to do their work. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so now by the time we get to the uh, slideshow, I'm going to be completely doubled, and I'll probably start talking a little, a little faster again. There we go. Now, I should really be apologizing to you, because I, I did fill with the computer to make sure that my slideshow would work. <laughs> In thinking about these, um, I can't I can't stress enough that within the beehive the bees are the masters, and we would be very very wise to follow where they lead. Um, on this. This box here has six entrance holes on the front. A couple are covered up by sponges right now. Um, oh, all right, give me one. And to make it better, let's try a little fence. Oh, there we go. All right, so that first picture on the right, bottom, your left, bottom, your left, shows a little bee. She's cute. She's got propolis in her mouth, and she is plugging up this hole right here on the top of our beehive. Now what I notice is that oftentimes when colonies are smaller, or even when they're fairly large, they like to seal up um, the, the top three holes, and that's going to help them better control the flow of air through the beehive, which impacts everything. It impacts brood nest temperature, and impacts how they make honey. Um, so the agenda for this slide is I'm going to play a bit about myself. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of links that you can um, further your education on, where to go about what the bees want, what they face in the landscape. I'm going to give you a lot of my philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> a few of my tips. No, no. I don't think that this controls that. I don't know how to work. Um, <laughs> this talk is, uh, I'm going to find a way to put it on my website. And after the board meeting, if the board decides that they want to put it on the club website too, 
it's going to go up on the club website. But for sure, this is going to go up on my website with an audio recording when we make a video of it, so you can watch it anytime. There's a lot of links in here, but once you get this public, you'll be able to click through them and research them. Um, take notes if it helps you, but know that a digital copy is coming. So whoever does, you pay attention. Here we go. Um, so like I said, I own Hercules Bees. It's uh, set up for getting other people started in pop bar beekeeping and beekeeper education. I was mentioned by Robert Kinney and Volker Ackerman. I was in the Peace Corps of West Africa for Forest Week. I was schooled in plant science, which is ecology and evolutionary based biology. And I'm from the area, I, I know the weather around here, I grew up in Hercules. I, I, re, I now live out in Antica, but I still keep my bees here and also increasingly in Antica too. Um, this is a picture of one of my first, one of my two apiaries in the Gambia. This is in the community garden of the village of Wallaran. And I just made the boxes with what I had. And in some cases, what I had was a termite mound that I, I molded into a top of a beehive. And it didn't work so well. Um, so I'm glad that we have a Home Depot. You can just go buy lumber. <laughs> Okay, so I've been keeping bees in California for four years. And just to give you some numbers, I run about 20 colonies. Once I had 35, and then I realized I'm stretched too thin, I need a real job. Um, but last winter, I lost 24% of my colonies over the winter time. And this will be the third year that I've been running treatment for bees. And 24% is not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. And splitting and swarms are easily going to make up for that number when beekeeping season begins. I pay out my landowners a, a gallon a year, have multiple landowners. Um, my success is all relative to the warm inland hills of Contra Costa County. And I'm not a pollinator. I don't constantly chase, change beehive locations. But what I think is very important is that this the source of my bees comes from swarms that I catch, splits that I make, or structural extractions that I do, um, where bees get into all sorts of places. Um, and it's kind of I'm just proud that we, I did this during the drought. So enough of me to sit the next slide. But the drought was scary. The drought was rather terrifying. Um, so. It's not that I keep top bar highs. That's not the reason for my success. It's really not. Bees just want a box. Um, but I like top bar highs. And I like how they're right here. They're right here for me. And I don't have to lift up any boxes. And what this means is I can spend more time looking at the bees and less time lifting boxes. I can leave my stuff out of the field. I don't have to spend as much time swapping frames around. Bees are going to draw their own wax comb, which is um, essential for, for treatment free beekeeping because it gets all of their glands active. Um, it's what they want to do anyway. So, this is how a top bar starts out with a, just a strip of foundation. And this is how it ends um, full of honey. There's a lot of bees in between there. Um, <laughs> is there. Can, Everybody can kind of see this? No, okay. Kind of? All right. Um, I think that being a horizontal hive system, the bees are, are very able to control heat and thin humidity from the brood nest to the honey areas um, very effectively. And during winter time, if you have your cluster in one side of the beehive, all the condensation that they make from breathing through the winter, that will spread outwards. And I haven't had a large problem with water falling on the cluster, which is problematic with leaving a lot of honey on in frame colonies. That water will go to the top and get on your cluster and then will die because they're cold play. It hasn't happened so much with the top bars. Okay, um, so these cones are big, and this is the, this, the design that I used for my top bar hives was written by Dr. Mangum. Um, who lives in North Carolina. And you'll notice that when you compare a honey super frame to the depth of, that's a small one, the depth of these top bar combs is that it is truly bigger. Um, they, the four foot box that you see there is the equivalent 
of 3.9 um, medium e-boxes. And I think that the depth of comb is, is very important because when the bees form their cluster, down at the bottom of the comb, they have enough honey above them to be able to move around during winter and still access all of their food. <clears throat> so if you were to build a top RV hive, make sure it's deeper rather than shallower so that they ha can have enough winter honey. Okay, so this is what I am doing. I am always leaving 30 extra pounds of honey on the colony. Now, I say extra honey because if I pulled out that big heavy top bar and I found a quarter sized patch of brood on it, that's not, that's, that's a brood comb. And that, none of that honey is extra honey. So and often I'm leaving like 50, 60 pounds of honey on my colonies because they grow better. Bees are gonna grow better when they have that reserve of calories and they have the reserve of the comb space to, to uh, store in coming back during pollen. Uh, I don't use chemicals uh, for just my, my own reasons. I'd like to try to bring these back to that point where we don't need them. Um, I'm always vigilant for American uh, thalberg outbreak. And treatment tree is not carefree, so we all need to be aware of what American thalberg is. And I haven't had any outbreaks of it, but should I have outbreaks, I'm prepared to burn equipment and restart the bees on clean equipment because this is not a joking matter. Um, I'm always searching for the best apiary locations I can find. I'm spending a lot of time on Google Maps saying, oh, there's eucalyptus over there, meadows over here, creeks over there, that's important. And then within the apiary, you've got to know where to put your hives that has sun exposure and so that it's not in the bottom of the valley where all the cold air is. You want to Treat, treat your bees like your pets, and I know we all do. We don't want to keep our dogs out in the cold. We don't want to keep our bees out in the cold air. Um, darn, there's parts of my slide you can't see. Is there a way to move the at all? I wrote too much. Okay. Um, that's, oh, okay. So what I'd like to do is incorporate that a little bit of the feral colony hardiness um, back into our gene pool of bees. And so I quote I quoted a little bit from uh, Randy Oliver because I think his scientificbeekeeping.com website is phenomenal. We should all be reading that. Um, one of the more interesting articles he wrote was about comparing feral hive genotypes to um, commercial hive genotypes and gene pool analysis. And he found out that feral colonies um, do maintain separation of uh, the feral gene pool and the domesticated gene pool. And it raises the question that one, how are they doing it? And two, for our for commercial pollination bees, we're selecting for something very strongly that has almost, that has very little fitness in the natural world. Fitness, the ability to put genes into the next generation. So many of the pollination bees that we use in America are like thin-skinned dairy cows. They, they would not survive in the forest if it weren't for um, uh, feeding support and, and herbicide support. Um, check out that link when you get the copy of the of the slideshow. Um, here's a picture of me bringing back some bees from a, uh, a cutout extraction. Um, for a few years I worked for Honeybee Specialties in Martinez and we took bees out of the bark train, we took bees out of the <laughs> churches, we took bees out of apartment complexes. You'd be surprised where they can get, but I really like it when they're at ground level. Um, <laughs> getting them back in, I even found out a way to get them back in top bar colonies by using a uh, hair clips and zip ties. You can get, it's easier to do with frame hives, but extractions are possible with top bars as well. Um, so here's your education. Here's what I like to read. Um, Lawrence John Connors written very good books about how to increase your apiaries and goes in depth about uh, bee mating biology, which is really interesting. Um, Randy Oliver's website, if you guys aren't modeling fancy with the science sheet, you should be. It's a good course. I've, I've been to the course a couple years ago, and you're going to learn something just by being around Randy. Um, Ed Clark wrote a great book about 
uh, how the bees make honey back in 1918, and it's still true, the bees haven't changed all that much. A lot of what you're going to hear from me philosophy-wise is in accordance with uh, Michael Bush. Uh, Dr. Mangum wrote the method book that I use. American Bee Journal, Bee Culture, BeeInformed.org are great uh, publications to keep aware of for the research. And there's even more people. There's Michael Palmer of Vermont, who has talked about the sustainable apiary and making nucleus colonies year-round to prevent the winter loss. Uh, Marla Civic, Civic talking about ecology in a broader sense. Uh, Jeremy Rose wrote a book for California beekeeping. Uh, Brother Adam is a holy man for beekeeping. Uh, Kirk Webster is a commercial treatment-free beekeeper out in <coughs> New England, and he does Russian bees. Now, we heard a little bit about Russian bees. Kirk Webster is so focused on bee breeding that the only way he, he maintains his treatment-free stock is with a a very precise plan to keep the Russian line strong because when the Russians interbreed with our commercial stocks, that's when they get noticeably uh, more taxi. And then, for point of view, uh, D is, um, you can plan on the B source forms. All good reads. Okay, so we don't know, but just to go over again, our bees have a lot to deal with. Habitat loss is the biggest one. We've paved over a lot of the meadows, and we've drained a lot of the wetlands in the Bay Area, and we put roads in between all, all of them. Um, and what habitat, habitat loss also means is that with cutting down the trees, the bees don't have enough good quality nest sites to continue to thrive. Um, we all know about Varroa, it's been here for about 30 years. We've got pollution in the environment and competition among the bees themselves. And now, Oh, and beekeepers can also be thought of as a problem from the perspective of the bees. Um, let me be the first to say that I've killed or crippled over a dozen colonies in learning how to keep bees. And I'm, not so I'm sorry for it, but the, uh, the learning experience is more valuable than a beehive. And so if you ever think, well, I shouldn't disturb the bees, but you also feel you need to learn, no, you've got to get out there and get the day along and learn about your bees. Um, so bees want to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> they want to get multi, multiple healthy swarms per year. They want the best nest site, and they will fight each other for it. And they want paid time off. <laughs> and say they work so hard making swarms, getting that summer honey crop in, and they're prepared to rest and groom themselves and maybe put out a late season queen, but then we go and take all their honey. Mm. That we're taking their honey at a time when they had low low body fats because when they get on a hot, strong honey flow, they will literally fly themselves to death working to prepare that honey crop. And then with that last little bit of energy, they raise a new generation. So a strong honey flow decreases body fat in our bees, which makes them more susceptible to disease. So we really have to time our harvesting. To, to, to keep the resilience up. Um, so the theme is we have to follow the bees, and then we can be more successful for it. The conclusion is, if we're cutting down all the trees, the very least we could do is have empty bait hives out of each apiary year-round. Maybe multiple bait hives, depending on the size of your apiary. I catch four to six ones a year like this while I'm, I'm not even in the yard. It's great. Um, the bigger, the bigger colonies are, the more honey they can make. And we are interested in honey. Um, so here's a couple pictures of a swarm just coming in um, while, a bir while a neighbor's birthday party was going on next door. <laughs> and they had a bounce house. Um, but the bees came, and in the end, it was OK. Um, so the thing is, they, inside the box, it's their world. That's the thing. Inside the box, it's their world. Uh, they prefer relative humidity at the brood nest of a, maybe a little higher than 60% because 50 to 60%, that's the average per hour humidity. But um, it's been shown that varroa mites don't reproduce well in high humidity. Um, and that may be a reason of why tropical bees, particularly bees in Africa, um, are able to cope with varroa <coughs> is a combination of weather and then their behaviors. Um, but heat in general helps them mature faster and helps their muscles build stronger. So that's one of the reasons why we always say 
put your beehives out of the sun. Because it was something in the, in the temperature, the humidity of it, the sunlight helps them out. Um, now, when they're trying to make honey in the back of the nest or the top of the nest, they don't want humidity in that area because having low humidity will help all of the water evaporate out through condensation. But in the brood nest, they like 50 to 60 percent. Um, there are there are citations for this. There are, I promise you, um, on the on the digital copy. Um, bees in a natural cavity, they start at the top, they build down. They use propolis, like I showed in that first picture. Now they use propolis in a couple cool ways. Number one is we all know that it, it cleans the house of microbes, it makes it an antibacterial. Um, it seals up the cracks in the beehive, which protects against Argentine ants. Argentine ants are a huge killer in California. Um, they make it airtight so that they can control that airflow. And number two says propolis varnishes the walls of the beehive. Um, after the breaks, you can come check out this two-foot box that has had bees lived in for quite a while. You'll see the traffic stains. We all see it in our hives. But the varnishing helps water stay on the wood instead of being soaked into the wood. And um, it just makes it easier for the bees to get the water out of the nectar. We want to make life easy for the bees after we've done all this other stuff to them. Um, Bees always want to be able to access all, thank you, I'm going to need that. Yeah. Bees always want to be able to access all parts of the hive. Haven't you ever walked, watched them crawl around the hive? They seem to be everywhere. They want to be everywhere because they're patrolling that whole hive all the time. Mm -hmm. So let's get to a couple of, oh, one more slide. Um, if we look at the bee brood nest or visualize it in our mind, if my fist is the very center of that brood nest, my fist is going to be solid worker brood. Around my fist will be more worker brood. And drone brood, we know from real life experience that this is mixed together. But often drone brood is on the outside. Then we have our pollen and our nectar band. And then outside that we have honey. And honey is a good insulator for the bees. Now this brood nest will move over the course of the season. It may start out here in spring and come over to here to summer and then back to winter, they'll come back here. It moves, but the general pattern of brood nest, you have to understand that that is it's like a layered cake. Um, I'm spending time on the basics because that shows us what the bees want. So here's tip number one. How many of us keep records when we go out to our bee colonies? Good, very good. Uh, this is my tip sheet, or my records sheet. Um, if I see eight cones with brood, I'll write eight slash three cones with honey. That's, that's how I do it. I use a one to five scale for pattern quality, disease, uh, pepper, and notes. We can keep track of where the queen made it, how old she is. Here's where I start saying some blasphemy. Number two, <laughs> throw out your screen bottom boards. Um, they allow way too much ventilation into the hive, and this slows down the honey making. In the winter time, this means that they have to spend a lot of extra energy just to keep themselves warm. Um, even if you have that slide in for the bottom for your Varroa accounting board, the bees can't walk on it, so they can't seal it with propolis, so it's not airtight, it's not ant tight. Um, a bit of history on them they were developed as IPM when um, commercial beekeeping was hit with the first waves of Varroa. And it's true that they do give a slight reduction in Varroa over the course of the season. But if you get rid of 15% of your row, you still have 85. That's still a lot of, of my client bees. Um, they're kind of expensive. I'm just not a huge fan. Um, and we see here that um, bees like to keep the brood nest at a constant temperature, somewhere between 93 to 96 degrees, depending on uh, the, their race of bees. And a quote from Randy Oliver saying, Keep your bees out in the sun. Sun helps them get up earlier and finish the day later. Sun helps them. Ventilation does not help them. So tip number three is insulate your beehives because insulation um, is going to help them ripen that honey. It's going to help them maintain the broodness temperature. I used uh, acoustic soundboard when I was running Langstroth colonies. It's you can buy it in varying thickness, but I had a half inch thickness. You can buy a four foot by eight foot sheet um, from a lumber store and cut it uh, to be the dimensions of your nuke or your, or your deep or whatever you have. 
Um, this is where telescoping covers are beneficial because they keep the, the insulation dry. Um, when you have these boards of insulation, you can also use a grain sack or a uh, sandbag, the woven plastic type material, the woven stuff, instead of the inner cover. You see on the photo here that um, I have the white grain sack, and above that I have the, uh, the insulation. The grain sack, these two things combined can take away the need for the wooden inner cover. Uh, the, the board itself of insulation is also useful during height inspections, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Okay, so here comes more philosophy. Do we really need to manage mites as a club here in one of the most plant diverse places in the world? Um, as hobbyists, we don't depend on bees for our living um, money. And the only way we can get to treatment-free bees, and this is something I know we all want, it may be a far distant goal, but the only way we can get there is if we stop treating our bees. Um, in the short term, that would mean huge le losses of bees for us because we sold over 400 packages through this club alone this year. But in a few short years, we, the bees would be able to repopulate the areas. Um, when we start with stock that has been supported uh, through protein feeding and sugar feeding and miticide treatments, it's, it's no wonder they will, they will die if we kick out those legs of support from under them. Um, treatment free though isn't as simple as letting your bees go. It, it, you'll have to change your goals. Um, Varroa is never going to go away. It's not. It's been here for 30 years. It's been on the Asian bees for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and as bad as Varroa is, there's another mite from the tropics that's very possibly going to jump species. It's called the Tropolelas mite. And just a link is enough to scare me. But this can cause a uh, collapse of a hive in weeks rather than the months that it takes Varroa to do. Um, we all need to read about Varroa from a, a number of different sources so we can have balanced opinions. Uh, we all need to know if Varroa might reproductive biology. Um, well, we know that Varroa mite causes the problems when the ratio between mites and bees uh, gets too many mites per bee, and then they get their diseases. <sighs> Talking about mites, when they lay in the brood in California, where we don't have a true, true winter, they're going through 10 to 12 generations a year, where our bees only go through a couple of generations when they swarm, one generation per swarm. So the varroa mites are, re are evolving at a much faster rate than bees are. And bees are evolving quite fast themselves. But we need to find ways to balance that host-parasite relationship and make a mite a less dangerous thing. Um, so in the broad picture, we all like honey. We like our honey producers and we have our favorite colonies. But in the broader ecological picture, if we have our honey producers, and those are grade A's, and we have our grade B and our grade C <coughs> colonies, and say some of our C's die over winter, that was expected, but some of them live. Those B and C colonies that manage to live and then next year overcome the sicknesses and then put forth drones, those are just as ecologically viable as our honey producers are. And these mid-grade survivors, I think, hold the key to developing the population of treatment free bees that we can then reselect again for honey production and gentleness and um, other traits. And I'm a big fan of gentle, gentle bees. I prefer to keep bees like I addressed before you today. So just food for thought. Um, so many of you must be scratching your heads and saying this guy's going to kill us all with his Varroa bombs. <laughs> um, what is a Varroa bomb? It's when Varroa population spikes, happens in the fall, and then it's spread to other colonies from the robbing. Now we can do, as bee keepers, not bee habits, but we keep bees, we have to be able to recognize when it's happening before our eyes, and then combine the colony or, or re-clean it to, to curb the infestation. Um, if, if you have brood full of varroa, it's not worth going into another colony. You can pick habits. If it's full of varroa, just feed it to your chickens. They'll love it. Um, there's a saying that says, take your winter losses and fall. You should know which colonies are very likely going to die over the winter. So just take your losses and fall. 
through combining. But if we do our beekeeping right, colonies are going to have a lot of honey on them in the fall. And we know that the bigger colonies are the stronger colonies, are the ones that are doing most of the robbing. But if our bigger colonies have combs full of honey and they're happy and they're full, they're going to be less likely to rob because they don't need to make up for that shortage of honey. So leave honey on your colonies. I think the true varroa bomb is one that's been fed year round and pushed to produce, produce, produce brood the entire season. Swarm control is happening the entire time and maybe the beekeeper hasn't made a split. That colony is hosting a very, very large mite population. And if that colony is not treated, that's the true varroa bomb right there. Because there are populations of feral bees that are living without any intervention from humans. And then there are all the other bees. Um, so going back to the varroa bomb, in the fall, that's when the bees are the weakest. They've been flying hard all summer to make honey. They've got low body fat. They need to raise the generation of winter bees to see us through the springtime. If you take out the honey between the varroa and the lack of food, they're going to they're gonna die. Um, here's a reference about how um, strong honey flows can cause bees to work themselves to the the exoskeletons. Okay. Um, a couple of just things I like to read and think about was um, it, the top one says that varroa really don't reproduce when relative humidity inside the brood nest is over 75%. Um, and then down below, I don't quite know how to tie it in, but we're in here in dry California. And so the water economy of the beehive is actually very important to us, especially during our long summer. Um, now when bees go feed water, it's like a, a garden hose going through the sky if you watch all those bees bringing water back to their hive. And as they get it out of their bodies and they, they breathe it onto the nest, old comb can absorb 11% of its own mass in water weight. That comb is a buffer for the nest. Um, from dryness, because the brood likes the brood likes to be significantly significantly wet. I just thought this was so amazing. I don't know what I think about it yet, but I just wanted to share it with you. Did you know comb could have store water in it? I did. Um, tip number four: changing changing our goal. I'm discussing treatment-free beekeeping, and I said once before that it requires that we have to change our goals. We need to recognize that the days of 200 pounds of honey off one colony is gone because the, the, plant, the plants aren't there anymore because of habitat degradation. We don't have giant fields of sweet clover anymore. Um, so extra honey, extra honey. Quarter-sized patch of brood is, is a brood comb to me. Um, I only harvest from the big colonies. This size here is about the size that a swarm would grow to fill in one year. But this is my honey producer. They have enough. I've, I've seen colonies with here to here, solid root. Solid root. And they want all that. But a box this size, you can take some honey off of them and, and not be concerned that they will be hungry after it. Um, I make harvests in June. I made a harvest today, but my biggest harvest comes in February. I don't really open up my beehives from November, roughly November through January. And then in February, some are dead, and others are full of honey that are left on from the winter for the previous year. So my biggest harvest comes in the fall. And that's the time when I can redistribute uh, pollen and, and, and uh, honey to growing colonies, make sure that they have enough food for spring increase. Um, number, it's repetition guys, this is very important. Body fat on your bees is a good thing. Helps them make better brood, um, gives them more resistance to diseases, and uh, they have to be fat in order to feed the brood. There's, there's probably more on my slide that I'm forgetting about, but you got the, you got the main points. Okay, so tip number five. Um, when spring is here, and we're reading from our bee journals, um, 
Our B journals, let me just, our B journals are often written for the industry, for the industry that pollinates our farms, our monoculture farms. They need huge bee populations to pollinate those big farms. And so a lot of our beekeeping literature focuses on production, whether it's production of honey or production of bees. And checkerboarding um, is a process where you take an empty frame, often with just foundation, and you put it in between brood combs. And this should stimulate the bees to, uh, to draw more comb and make more nests. And you're supposed to do it when there's a, a nectar flow on. But when you do that, when, when, when that happens and the, the, the brood is split, the bees overall have to work harder to keep the whole thing hot. And um, varroa, along with high humidity being harmful to varroa, varroa have also been found to reproduce a little bit better in lower temperatures. So if you're spreading out the brood, you're also helping varroa a little bit reproduce. Um, and it's just such a huge waste of energy, to, in my opinion, to, to split the brood. You're better off just splitting the colony and having two colonies rather than trying to drop one bar of honey in between all the, all the brood. Um, let's see. So the solution that I have found for manipulation, if you want to um, get the bees to grow a little bit faster, is to put an empty frame or an empty top bar right in between the brood and the pollen band. Because that's at the outside of the brood nest. That's where the bees would normally make the next one. Um, for, for a frame hive, that's more difficult because you have to think within the square. But for a top bar hive, you have pretty good uh, placement over, over where you can drop up a new, a new frame to encourage uh, them to grow in the right way and to grow in both directions. All year long, we should be making nucleus colonies. We should be making splits all year long, except for the late summer and the, of course winter. Um, but when you, when you make these increased colonies, you're making the bees breed again, which shuffles all their genes and they evolve faster when they're constantly breeding. Um, the more splits we make, the more generations we have, the faster we're going to move along the host parasite relationship and the quicker we're going to get mites that kill less bees. Uh, also, for practical um, reasons, if we have more colonies going into winter, we'll have more colonies coming out of winter. If you ever find queen cells from a swarm event or you see your swarm leave, that's the perfect time to make splits. Oftentimes the swarm leaves when the capping goes on the first queen cell. So we go into our hive, we find eight queen cells, perfect, make splits, right then. Between this and swarms, you shouldn't want for bees, not, not here in the Bay Area. We have literally one of the best spots in the country for beekeeping here. We're really lucky. Uh, okay, so tip number seven, of course, is know your plants. You need to know, and this is just a couple of them. Um, these are the ones I can think of the top of my head that I use for kind of judging what's going on in the landscape. Uh, plant trees like eucalyptus trees will bloom for extended seasons. Others like the, the manzanita have a brief blooming period towards mid-spring. Um, and we can think about what kind of manipulations we make um, based on what's going on in our environment. Uh, the petoniaster on the right hand side is this not California native shrub, but it's often in hedges in, in the Bay Area, suburban areas. That's one of my plants that I use to mark the end of spring. When I see the petoniaster go off, I say, well, by now most colonies should be having drones. Um, splits are good to make right now, and it's in, in my area. That for me, that's the end of spring. Um, we need to all be gardeners. I know many of us are gardeners. All of us should be gardeners. Uh, we want to garden for plants that give off summer nectar and pollen. If you're stumped for what you should plant, try the Greenland sage, the white sage, um, sunflowers. Really good. Uh, when, you, when you start keeping track of this year by year, you will become a better beekeeper. You really will. <coughs> So, so what is treatment free anyway? Why is this guy up here talking about all this blasphemy? Um, these are the four main rules of it is, number one is obvious enough, but number two is only natural feed. 
Now, I love my bees, and I never want to see my bees die of starvation. Um, but when I say natural feed, that means I'm going to feed them with honey or nectar from another, from another beehive rather than mixing together sugar syrup. Sugar, honey, honey is very acidic. Sugar syrup is more pH 6 to 7. Honey is about pH 3. And it, it messes with their digestion. It's not their natural food. Pollen supplement is not their natural food. Um, and so if we, we, we can't support the bees by feeding them cheeseburgers, we've got to feed them um, what they naturally eat. But I'm not against starving your bees. Give your bees honey from other strong colonies if you think that will get them through to the next pulse of nectar. Um, there's, been some, there's been some other research that I didn't cite that says that the, uh, the making of the bee bread, where they mix it with a little bit of honey to keep it in the comb for a long time, that may not make it more digestible to them, but it certainly does preserve the nutri nutrition of the pollen, but it may not make it more digestible for them. So, uh, on a tangent, um, we always hear about native bee colonies dying when they eat tainted pollen, and we say, well, our honey bee colonies are going to be okay because they can kind of reduce the toxicity of it. I'm, I'm not so sure that's true. All bees are affected by, by uh, pollen that has been affected by neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, number four is very important. If you have bees that are kicking butt and treatment free, you owe it to all of us and larger bees in the world to split that colony, maybe even do some clean grafting off that colony. Um, awareness for the beekeeper is important. 300 pound honey cross colony, those days are gone. Um, because we're, we're, plant, we're using every little bit of land much more efficiently these days than we have been 80 years ago. Um, bees are generally more resilient, less resilient, and uh, <laughs> probably something about climate change. Changing environmental conditions. Ten minutes. Ooh, I gotta stop. I gotta start talking faster. All right. So the message in this talk is everything we do has some sort of impact. Feeding has an impact. All these things on the top have an impact. Stuff I haven't listed that we do has an impact. But colonies don't experience all this. So how do they live year to year? How do they do it in the absence of all this human interaction? Well, they do it by increased swarming. Certainly, they do it by increased swarming. It gives them a break in the brood cycle, breaks up the reproduction of varroa. Swarming and superseding when they replace, replace the queen. Absolutely, that's how they do it. Second way they do it is by grooming themselves and by grooming the hive, by regulating the varroa uh, temperature and the humidity of the hive to keep varroa in check also. This um, behavior is different. They often start build up later than our commercial Italians. They'll overwinter in smaller clusters. These changes of behavior that the feral bees have um, eventually codes for different genes and results in different genetic pools for ferals and, and other bees. Okay, tip number eight is love your drums. Um, with, with foundationless comb, Bees often put drone comb and worker comb on the same top bar, and it's really not cost effective, time effective for me to go out and take out only drone comb. Um, and also, drones are important for mating, so they, they are essential to the hive. Um, drone culling is a practice by which you can um, drop a frame meant for drones into the beehive, and it's all the varroa prefer to breed on the drones, they breed on the drones, you cut the drones out, feeding the chickens. You've just reduced significantly the varroa load of your hive. And during certain times of the year, like the first time in spring or the last round of drones to be produced for the season, that's very effective IPM. And that's one I'm actually kind of ambivalent about. I think it has some very good points to it. But if you do it all year, every year, you're messing up the bees. They're going to stop what they're doing, make more drone home every month, and it interferes with their momentum of trying to put away a honey crop. They want drones. They want drones. Um, whether they have a small population or a big population of drones, they are always trimming the drone brood or laying more to have a maximum effective squadron of drones to be able to go pollen mate with the queen. Um, so if we're always messing them up, we're going to mess up 
the larger genetic pool of our bees also. Um, drones also can accept nectar in their own honey crop from a worker. So if we're experiencing phenomenal nectar flow and you, for the fun of it, decide to squish a drone, there's a good chance that nectar is going to come out of that drone. Um, if, if they can't put it in the comb, they'll put it in the drone until they... Uh, <laughs> Also, if the row are on the drones, they're not on the workers. And if they're not on the workers, then we're going to have healthy workers to go out and get more resources. So I think drones are good. Drone culling can be good. It shouldn't be done year-round. Um, and thinking about <coughs> colonies, even when the queen goes and there's just a few bees left, they still they lay drones. And that allows a colony to have a chance, at least, to get their genetics into the next generation. Um, they beast. I, I love you. Okay, so just let me remind you about who I am, what I'm doing. Um, my goal for starting this business was just to grow. I just wanted to grow and have bees. And I was coming back from the Peace Corps. I didn't have any money. So um, I wanted to do this as cheaply as possible. And I, I thought, well, I can try to breed back for resistant bees. So I wanted to be sustainable. So I did cutouts with extractions and, and trading with other beekeepers. Um, Oftentimes, I don't. I think we can do damage actually by going into our hive every week or every two weeks. Bees want some time to themselves. Um, I'm at the point now where I see every beehive about once a month. Sometimes I don't see them for three months, and that's shame on me. But um, every time we inspect beehive, especially if we're still learning about the bees, um, and we're taking all this stuff apart and we can cause them some trauma. We can certainly disrupt their their day of bringing resources back into the hive. And what if we were inspecting on one of the days of peak nectar flow? Well, we, we just really, really hurt them. So giving them time in between is good. Building your skills is also very important. So get familiar with your tools. Um, if my excitement makes it sound easy, it takes a lot of attention. Uh, you all know it takes attention. Um, I'm probably running out of time. No, you're good. You're good. Got 10 minutes? Oh, yeah. Um, if you want to be a treatment for beekeeper, start it next year. I'm not, I am not encouraging you to get away from your original plan this year. Because if you bought a package through the club, those bees were made for pollination. Um, they, should be, they should be treated with some sort of miticide. But next year, if your bees survive, they become a little bit more acclimatized. Or you can propagate from your good stock. You can find a friend and, and get one of their colonies. You can get a swarm. Next year, you can start taking steps towards treatment-free beekeeping. Um, <laughs> here's a conservative path for it. Have a, have a control. Have a group that you normally treat and something that you don't. And you can compare the difference. Last year in America, beekeepers lost 44% of all colonies. So it says the Bee Informed Partnership. If you do better than 44%, you're on something, I want to hear about it. <laughs> um, it's not carefree. We, uh, let's have some participation. Who knows what an American Calgary is and can recognize it in their colonies? All right, that's great. We've got to always be vigilant for it because our hobby is growing. There's so many more new beekeepers. We've got to teach them about American Falbrood or we could have a huge bacteria outbreak and take down the whole county. Um, as treatment-free beekeepers, uh, if the bees are swarming more often in response to varroa, we need to be extra responsive to swarm calls. Or we should be making nukes the whole season long. We need to garden. We need to talk to our neighbors about gardening. We need to teach our kids about gardening. We need to talk to our city councils about gardening for increasing bee forage, because such a big problem with the bees is that they don't have the wildflower meadows that they used to have. Um, so I figured out how to keep bees alive. I haven't figured out how to get the maximum amount of honey from them yet. And so I myself have a lot of skill in maximizing a honey crop with still having losses only around 20-25%. Um, okay. The last little bit is about being comfortable in the inspection. Um, Oftentimes, for new beekeepers, I don't recommend wearing a full bee suit. Uh, you get too hot, you get too uncomfortable, you can't see what's on the comb, and you need to learn about biology and, and really see what, what is on, what they're doing. Um, but more, most importantly, you have a false sense of invincibility. 
Uh, the bees will still get you. <laughs> if, now, if I have a full-size colony, or I know that this one's a little bit more feisty, I definitely wear a veil. We all should wear veils for safety. Um, but maybe always work your way towards getting to not use gloves, because these things are how they let you know that you've done something wrong, and they want to tell you about it. If you absolutely need gloves, try wearing a latex glove. They offer some protection against stings, but you still have dexterity. Goat skin gloves are good too. Just throw the cowhide gloves out the door. You don't need them. Um, I think we should all get some because it improves our skill, lets us know what we're doing right or wrong, and it will build, your, your body starts to react less and less to apotoxin the more you get stung. Um, but really, just shirt, jeans, something with a collar, you're good to go. Sun hat, hats are good. Um, this is what I had to wear in the Gambia. Um, if, if I tilted my head back, the bees would come at me through the, uh, through the veil there. And it was subtropical era. We had these thick vinyl gloves that we had to tie on. Um, and the bees would just clump on us by the hundreds. It's not like that here. I love it. Um, when you get stung, the whole thing is we've got to keep the colony calm. We always have to keep the colony calm. So when you get stung, the bee just tagged you, and if it gets away, it's going to tell the other bees too. So in, a, in about five seconds, catch the bee, crush its head, throw it away, take out the string, get the stinger out, get a leaf, rub your arm, smoke your arm. Smoke the bees because if the bee is facing towards you, it's probably watching you. <laughs> so you give them a hug, and then they all go back down. And then, then you can start to curse because it's probably starting to hurt now. But um, you want to hide the smell of the injured bee uh, to keep the bulk of the colony calm. And then you can continue your inspection. If you have a Langstroth sack and you're making honey, these things get tall, right? Yeah. Um, how can you keep the brood together, limit same conditions? This is what you do. You start with your hive cover, put it on the ground. Get your honey supers, stack them. Like, and, and make sure to angle the corners like you see I've done there. Um, that keeps most of the bees in the dark. It makes it easy so you can pick the box back up. If you have two brood boxes, you put one on the ground. But you work with the bottom box. You can, because right now, bees are constantly returning to that bottom box, and you need to get through that as quick as possible so that you can move on to the next box and, and hide more bees. The more bees that you expose to sunlight, the more that they're going to get off task and stain your face. <laughs> um, this slide talks about what I just said. So we, uh, we've got to use our hive tool. Hold it like I'm holding the microphone right here. It's not, it's not a pencil. It's a tool, okay? So hold it strong. And your lever end is the one that's curved. You can use that to pry apart stuff. You've got the spatula end to get in there. Get comfortable with that tool. Um, if a bee lands on your hand, whatever, just flick it off. It's not going to hurt you. Sometimes I have bees crawling all along my hands while I'm still working the colony. You'll know by how they're crawling on you whether they're just chilling or whether they're going to sting you. Um, Frame shakes, you should. <laughs> we should all practice this, the shake to get the bees off the comb so that we can see the comb. And um, I really like having a spray bottle of just water um, in my apiary during hive inspection so I can clean off nectar and clean off the honey. Uh, that keeps. Honey, the honey smell makes bees think that they're being robbed and it makes them more defensive. So if you clean up the honey smell, they'll be calmer overall. Uh, this is why the Randy Oliver class is going to be gold for people. Sign up. Um, the bigger, the, if we can keep big clumps of bees together, that keeps them on task. And what we're doing is we're conserving the, uh, the level of pheromones among all the bees. If we, if we open up all the frames and let a bunch of air in there, let a bunch of sunlight in there, that pheromone is going to dissipate. Bees are going to wonder what's going on, and then they're going to look for you. Um, so if you keep 
these in as large a group as possible. That's going to help them. That's when you can take the insulation that you are now, are all now going to put in your beehives. Take the insulation and put that on top of the stack of uh, supers. Put that board there. And that tower is closed off now. We're working with a few scenes of bees at the same time. Uh, bee stress is real. We stress them when we move their comb around. Malnutrition, dehydration, siege from ants. All these things stress them. Bee stress is real. Just like human stress is real, bee stress is real. And uh, so we may not need ventilated. Well, I already told you about that. Um, <laughs> just, just always think about what I want somebody else doing this to my house. <laughs> Um, so now we get down to some, some real nuts and bolts. Am I making a difference in all this? I don't know. Um, I keep about 20 colonies, give or take a couple. I started that this year. I sold down to about 12. Now I'm building, building my way back up for this season. Um, my little bit of colonies are just some of the thousands in this county. And I don't, I know I'm not having a big impact on the regional population, but um, I like to think that I'm incorporating more of the aphis mellifera subspecies mellifera genes back into my population of bees. I should get them um, sampled, but I, I don't know, uh, but I like to think that I'm doing something. If you want to learn about bee biology, again, go back to Randy Oliver. He's written it out, taking it out of the scientific journal and put it in common seek with a bunch of pictures that show how genes are transmitted generation to generation. There's your link. Um, but to get back to the larger question about do we as NVBA members need to manage mites is a big question um, because it looks like breeder queens for the industry will be increasingly sourced from survivor stock from urban suburban areas, areas where there isn't heavy intensive agriculture because that's, that's, that's it. Um, in conclusion, we all love the bees. I hope I didn't offend anybody too much tonight. Um, and those, this is just what I've been doing for me. It's been working for me. It may not work for you. Um, but if you find success in what you do, share it with us, because we all need to learn. We all need to garden. Have I hit that enough yet? You all need to garden. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. I'm probably over time. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to let you know about our next speaker in July. It's going to be Doug.